preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening. I'm Laura Kaminsky, Associate Director of Education, and I'd like to welcome you to the third evening of our series, The Human Mind. The format tonight is the usual. Following the lecture, there will be an opportunity for you to submit your questions written on the index cards you received upon entering the hall. In about 45 minutes, ushers will come down the aisles, collect the cards, and bring them backstage for presentation. Our guest tonight, Dr. Edward Osborne Wilson, Jr., has been on the faculty of Harvard University since receiving his doctorate there in 1955. He has held the positions of Assistant Professor of Biology, Associate Professor, and Professor of Zoology. In 1973, he was appointed Curator in Entomology at the Museum of Comparative Zoology, and in 1976 was named Frank B. Baird, Jr. Professor of Science, positions he holds currently. Dr. Wilson's research interests include evolutionary biology, the biology of social insects, the classification of ants, sociobiology, biogeography, and ethical philosophy. Among the many works he has authored or co-authored are A Primer of Population Biology, Life on Earth, Sociobiology, The New Synthesis, On Human Nature, Genes, Mind, and Culture, and Promethean Fire. Dr. Wilson has about 250 technical publications to his credit and has contributed to the more popular Scientific American. A member of the National Academy of Sciences, he's also a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and one of the American Philosophical, and of the American Philosophical Society, as well as the German Academy of Sciences. Dr. Wilson has lectured at many universities throughout this country, including the University of Pennsylvania, Johns Hopkins, Cornell, Princeton, and Rice Universities, and at Oxford and Cambridge Universities in England. We're delighted that Dr. Wilson is here tonight to present his lecture, which is titled The Evolutionary Origins of the Mind. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. Thank you for coming. And I really regret that I'm stuck way up here in the air. It's uh, one of the few stages I've ever been on. I couldn't get down if I wanted to. But I hope we'll keep it relaxed, informal, and that what I have to say tonight might lead to uh, questions and discussions that um, will involve you. Now, may I have the first slide? And I'd like to use this uh, slide that we are going to get here in a minute. Maybe I'm supposed to push a button. Yep. Um, to introduce what is technically a complicated subject and probably one that we've tended to um, underestimate in terms of his accessibility. When he was a very young man in his notebooks, uh, Darwin showed a fascination with the origin of the mind, the evolution of the mind, uh, and he spoke of his concern that we could never take the citadel by direct assault but that somehow we had to devise scientific stratagems for entering it, uh, analyzing it, and reconstituting it. And then he gave up on any effort that he might have contemplated and devoted the rest of his life to zoology. Um, now we are in a position through neurobiology, the study of the nervous system, through increasingly sophisticated approaches in the social sciences, and through the emergence of cognitive uh, psychology and what has been called the quiet revolution of psychology that finally loosened the iron grip of behaviorism in conjunction with evolutionary biology, which um, has spawned the field of sociobiology that attempts to unite studies of social behavior and, and uh, evolutionary theory and genetics, uh, we have reached the edge of terrain that, if appropriately explored over the next 10 or 20 years, may well give us a new glimpse into the origin of the mind as in evolution. When we speak about human evolution, traditionally, 
and with caution uh, uh, concerning our own biases and trepidations about the mind, we tend in popular literature and courses on human evolution and so on everywhere to limit our consideration to bones and anatomy and superficial aspects of uh, behavior. But the guts of human evolution, the mind and social behavior and the origin of cultural transmission, all the things that make us distinctively human, a distinct species, we've tended to uh, neglect. Uh, human evolution means fundamentally the origin of the brain and the mind. And that's what I'm going to address tonight. And I'm going to take a, an approach which uh, is closely associated with the relatively new discipline of, of sociobiology, which is defined as the systematic study of the uh, biological basis of social behavior, uh, and introduce this by the concept of kin selection, uh, 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 take this as the uh, central subject in sociobiology, and use it as an entree to our consideration of the origin of mind. You're wondering what this is, unless you're an art or history buff, and it's Paul Delaroche's uh, portrait of, um, or imaginary rendition, really, of the death of Cardinal Mazarin, the powerful minister to Louis XIV. And he's on his deathbed. And he's about to pass on without issue, without children or descendants. But uh, he is not leaving a, um, a blank as far as his genetic heritage is concerned, because surrounding him on his deathbed are his nieces and their husbands, to whom he has raised to high position and power and wealth and prosperity and the prospect for having many children. And the biologist then looks at situations like this and says, look, altruism, at least with reference to one's close relatives, uh, can go so far as to incorporate celibacy or even sacrifice of your own life. And if you do it right, if it is directed and cleverly um, programmed, then that altruism may be altruism at the level of the individual but it is not altruism at the level of the gene. Uh, and here we speak of the selfish gene, the strategy of altruism directed particularly toward relatives, because by favoring relatives in this manner, ensuring uh, their greater survival and production of children, uh, Cardinal Mazarin and many other uh, altruists, in fact, are proliferating genes that are identical to their own by common descent. In fact, he shares with these nieces one-eighth of their genes, of his genes, by common descent. This strikes many as a cynical approach, but it's not meant to be. What it is is a, a naturalistic, truly biological uh, model applied to human behavior. It has worked spectacularly well, this model of kin selection, among other approaches in theory from sociobiology and other aspects of evolutionary biology. And it has begun to be used to varying, with varying success in studies of human behavior. And I don't want to imply that we can rigidly describe and analyze all of human altruism by this means, but we can do we can illuminate a great deal of it uh, in that means. Now, this has been the main approach of the, bi of the evolutionary biologist, reconstructing evolutionary history of the mind and uh, of, of the outermost aspects of human social behavior um, to reduce it to survival and multiplication of the genes because this, after all, has been the basis of the origin of the brain about which I'll speak more later. We know of no other mechanism on this earth, at least, no other mechanism that can be put within the domain of explanation of the physical and natural sciences uh, of, um, than um, natural selection and evolution of the human brain and the mind being a product 
of the human brain. So this is the biological approach. It has proven spectacularly successful in so many other areas of medicine, and biology, uh, natural history. We are now posing the question, can it be applied with equal effectiveness to the origin of the human mind? The original approach of sociobiology and evolutionary biology uh, which is the parental discipline, uh, was to deal with central tendencies, to ask what there are, uh, what, uh, there are of, of common tendencies in human beings, of, uh, of unified traits of human nature that we all possess uh, that uh, might be explained and, and probed more deeply by models like those of kin selection. Now, this approach uh, in the face of dazzling uh, cultural diversity that does exist gains credence uh, when we examine, for example, the basic uh, uh, the, the facial expressions that we use to denote uh, basic emotions. Uh, in, in a series of experiments uh, conducted a few years ago, Paul Ekman of the University of California took photographs of um, Americans of European descent expressing theatrically, in the, mo in the manner of silent movies, uh, it, the various basic emotions, took them to uh, a remote tribe in Papua New Guinea, only recently uh, contacted, and therefore with their own cultural traditions intact and preserved from European um, uh, uh, effect, at least, and showed these photographs to the uh, Papuans and at the same time, and asked them to uh, interpret them, at the same time got the uh, Papuans to act out emotions and stories and plays of their own and photograph them as they, as they express those uh, similar emotions, then took those photographs back to the United States and showed them. And the uh, accuracy with which the facial expressions were read in terms of which of the basic emotions they depicted was 80%, which is quite remarkable for two cultures that have evolved apart for many tens of thousands of years. Here are these other basic emotions. And human ethologists, that is people who describe behavior in a naturalistic manner, have cataloged a wide array of other facial and paralinguistic signals that people share around the world with remarkably little variation. They include things like the eyebrow raise with a slight smile. That's the, uh, the greeting. That's a greeting a signal that you give, paralinguistic. You know, raise your eyebrow with a little bit of smile. Worldwide. Um, running the tip of your tongue over your lips, that's an aversive signal that's universally given uh, to indicate quite unconsciously on the part of most people uh, that they don't want to be disturbed. Uh, you do it frequently when you're concentrating and someone's trying to talk to you or there's some other distraction and you run your lips. It's uh, very similar to a similar signal used by non-human primates, apes and monkeys, uh, when they want to indicate they do not wish to be approached by another member of the troop and uh, so on. Now, uh, these uh, interesting uh, basic uh, traits that we share as part of human nature and even as part of primate nature in some cases uh, are given further uh, emphasis with uh, the knowledge that we now have some 3,577 genes identified by the newest techniques in molecular biology. That figure is as, as of um, a year ago last summer. I check in with uh, Victor McElroy at Johns Hopkins every year or so he, to see what the latest number is. It keeps going up all the time. Uh, he, keeps the, uh, he keeps a catalog of them. About 3,500, I suspect it's approaching 4,000 by this time, out of an estimated roughly 250,000 genes that exist. We're in a position to do a complete mapping of all of the DNA uh, sequences, nucleotide uh, pair sequences. And in fact, uh, many biologists have begun to call for a NASA level effort to do a complete map of the human genome on all of the 23 pairs of chromosomes that we possess. 
uh, it would be a little bit more difficult to do a complete gene map because each gene consists of uh, on the order of a hundred or more of these nucleotide pairs uh, and they're a little more difficult to map but we could do right from the start with a few billion dollars uh, a complete map if we wished. The point being that we have the uh, capacity, it's, it's, you know, it'd be like the, uh, a landing on Mars. We have technically in our grasp right now the ability to do a complete nucleotide map of the human species. And uh, the, uh, th this, this uh, is from my book on the origin of the mind called Promethean Fire, and it shows uh, the uh, chromosomes of each of the 23 human pairs. Those are the ones on the left in each one of these pairs, and they are matched directly e in each case for the 23 with the uh, chimpanzee chromosome to its right. So you can scan that. That's as shown by high-resolution optical microscopy with a banding of the chromosomes. You'll see a remarkable correspondence between the human chromosome and the, uh, and the chimpanzee chromosome. Not too surprising for um, biochemists and, and students of um, human evolution, fossil history of human evolution, uh, who are in rough agreement now that uh, the chimpanzee line and human line may have diverged as recently as five million years ago and almost certainly not more than 10 million years ago. And that's a remarkable amount of evolution to have occurred in a relatively short eye blink of geologic time. Um, now, of those three to four thousand genes that have been identified, that you know at least characterized in some respect, uh, many of them mapped onto these onto the chromosomes as we understand them, uh, now have been found genes that affect uh, very uh, uh, very specific forms of human behavior, including social behavior, in a precise manner. Uh, for example, performance on spatial tests, certain spatial tests but not other spatial tests that affect dyslexia, uh, the wiring of our um, verbal, uh, the parietal areas of the, uh, of the brain, possibly depression. And twin and adoption studies uh, conducted with increasing sophistication so as to partial out all the environmental influences and reduce it down to uh, constitutional factors, including genes, uh, now have implicated genetic part of human genetic variation uh, as being genetic in quite complicated behaviors, including schizophrenia, uh, manic depressive cycling, uh, altruism by standard studies of empathy, uh, questionnaire studies of empathy, homosexuality, and a wide range of personality traits. So now let me, uh, having expressed then one, that we're beginning to get new insights with the aid of basic biological theory into some of the central tendencies of human social behavior. Only a tiny fraction of those exist to be sure, but some of them. And uh, having noted that our knowledge of human genetics is progressing at a virtually accelerating pace thanks to new techniques for mapping genes and chromosomes and sophisticated studies in genetics. Now we come to the crucial question, the grandmother, in my opinion, of questions in biology and the social sciences, still unanswered, and it is the following. We know that all human behavior, virtually all, is transmitted by culture, teaching, learning, culture. We know, and I'll document this farther as, as we go along, that human behavior, uh, even though culturally transmitted, is very much affected by our biology. The way we transmit it and what information we're prone to transmit is strongly affected by our biological heritage. So we know that each contributes in some complex way during mental development. The question now remains, one of the great unsolved problems of science is how have cultural evolution and biological evolution interacted during human evolution to produce what we recognize intuitively the human, of the, as a human mind, and how does that linkage between culture and biology affect our everyday lives and our future? And this is what I would like to address in the all too brief period of time I have 
remaining. Now, I believe that the key and increasing number of both psychologists and, and biologists interested in this uh, problem, and surprisingly few are interested in it. This is one of those remarkable areas of science which seem to be all important, and yet it's drawn the attention of surprisingly few natural scientists concerned with the analysis of it, uh, using the techniques and methodologies that are at our disposal. But there is a consensus now that the key is in development, the interaction of genes and culture and how those produce an individual mind, and particularly cognition, the study of all the mental process that goes from perception in the sense organs through the organization uh, of that sensory information and passage into uh, law and storage in long-term memory and then recall out of long-term memory and the short-term memory and, and the conscious centers of the mind and then decision-making, drawing on emotional coloring and subliminal memory and the like. Uh, the nature of cognition then during the development of the mind is where our focus should be, even more than on pure genetics, on pure outward description of phenomena like Cardinal Mazarin and his altruism. Now, I'm going to suggest, and this has uh, been work that has uh, come from uh, uh, my colleague at the University of Toronto Medical School, Charles Lumsden, and myself, and have been published in a couple of books on this subject, I'm going to suggest that there are three traits in cognition that have been discovered by cognitive uh, biology, uh, uh, psychologists, which uh, provide us possibly with a clue to how the whole thing works. Not enough of a clue yet to be able to put it together, you know, like the double helix or Mendelian genetics, but enough of a clue to tell us that this may be the way to go in future research. And these three uh, properties of human cognition, which we now understand better, far better than we did even five or ten years ago, are the following. They are the node link structure of long-term memory. That's number one. The second is the necessity to process information in the sh in short-term memory in the conscious mind when we process information. We, it goes through a very narrow bottleneck and we have to process it in a serial manner. This has an enormous effect on how the mind works and how biology and culture work together. And the third trait is the bias in the processing. And I'll now illustrate all three, hopefully without burdening you with too much technical detail, some of which admittedly I only half understand myself although I have the impression that not very many un psychologists understand it either, and this is one of them. Um, it's the node link structure. It is the conception, it actually came originally from computer science, but has gained some credence in studies of cognitive psychology and theory of memory. It's a notion, a really a very s common sense notion, uh, that uh, memory really is broken up into discrete units. And we can say, therefore, also culture can be broken up into discrete units of all important consideration for the scientific study of culture. And these units uh, are called roughly uh, nodes and they consist at the uh, an atomic level, the most simple form, the, the, the ultimate form that can be broken down, and yet we can't characterize it in terms of the way the brain works, but we can intuitively see it. The ultimate unit sometimes referred to as a concept. Now, concepts are uh, single images, often with a word attached to label them and to summon out emotional and other coloring with them. Dog, red, run are simple concepts. And when they are summoned out of long-term memory, out of those 10 billion or more cells that have twisted our cranium into this grotesque globular shape that must look horrible to gorillas and chimps. You know, it's almost like we must look almost to them the way these fictional Martians would look, you know, when you see them where they're all bald and they have huge hydrocephalic-like heads and so on. That's the way we must look to them. Well, we've gone through this terrible transformation. Our, 
a bulging brow, a flattened face, and, and so on, little tiny jaw, uh, uh, as to pack in that huge amount of uh, uh, nervous tissue. I'll, I'll come up to that later. But out of this immense store of long-term memory, we pull out concepts uh, like red dog and running. Then we immediately, they start to be linked together. The, they pull out automatically by associative learning, some of which is more easy to acquire than others, pull out uh, by associative learning uh, other concepts, and they get linked together. Dog, furry, running, speed, reckless, this kind of thing. Um, the, uh, the node link structure then that, that has something that is in action or passing through time like dog running is sometimes called a proposition. That's another somewhat more complicated form of node link structure in this particular way of looking at the, along, at the, at the mind. And then stories or short accounts such as an account of how dog would run to catch a rabbit um, are the schema, schemata. Uh, which of psychologists, uh, a schema being a more complicated array of these. And this diagram shows how one uh, cognitive psychologist translated two Piagetian stages uh, in uh, the child's the development of a child's uh, conception of what is a living thing, which if you know Piagetian sequences, this goes from uh, very simple conceptions in a very small child in which anything that moves virtually is thought of as living. It's just classified together in a child's mind as living. Then gradually gets more and more sophisticated in distinguishing animate from inanimate objects. And um, this can be translated into uh, node link structure for further analysis. Now we move on to the uh, second trait of mental process, and that is this uh, bottleneck that we go through. We have to uh, treat a great deal of our decision making, conscious process, uh, in, uh, in a stream because a short term memory has such a limited capacity. You can uh, look at something like this and uh, then close your eye, for example, and keep in your eye up to about 14 symbols. That's called iconic. Uh, memory or the immediate after image for a few seconds, you, you can retain that. Or if you summon out of long-term memory visual concepts, you can summon out about four simultaneously and keep them in your mind simultaneously. That's about the limit. Someone once defined genius or after an analysis of the way Einstein thought uh, as consisting in part at least of being able to maintain more imagery and more processes you know, in short-term memory and therefore the white-hot centers of consciousness than most people. And when you can do that, then, then you can draw far more, uh, more analogies, you know, by simultaneously running processes in, in whole different roles, you know, like how the stars are moving with quantum mechanics simultaneously, then you can see cross linkages in your own mind and get that great and intuitive leap about how to maybe explain something in between. Um, and the final, uh, trait, that, and that's an important one in uh, how, how our mind works in terms of culture, and I'll come back to that. Then the third cognitive trait I mentioned is bias in processing. And let me illustrate you uh, this. Uh, I think most of you are familiar with the tremendous number of tricks that the mind, quote, tricks the mind plays on us, it's, it, but they're far more. Uh, numerous and profound than most people realize because, you know, like fish in the sea, we've grown up there and we can't think of any other environment, uh, cognitive or mental environment than the one we live in. Uh, to illustrate this, um, uh, we have here uh, two prints of the, uh, our last two presidents. And um, what uh, has been done is that the mouth has been cut out uh, of this print, the triangle, and the eyes and the triangles, and they, those triangles, uh, I'm sorry, uh, quadrangle, rectangle, and they've been turned upside down and post pasted back on. Then the entire print has been turned 180 degrees. Yet in spite of that bizarre configuration, I think most people would see Mr. Carter and Mr. Reagan as being somewhat normal, and, they, and you know, you would accept that they're smiling at you. 
Now, uh, now I'm going to just take those identical modified prints and turn them 180 degrees, right side up, as it, as it were, and show you the horrible truth. <laughs> this is the way Mr. Reagan must be feeling nowadays. Um, the, um, my only political or ideological remark of the night. Um, this emphasizes or illustrates in a loose way how much emphasis human beings put in their, their cognition. This is true from early infancy on, on the exact configuration of the mouth and the eyes, uh, so that we tend to isolate this, these features uh, even when they are presented in our own minds, even when they're presented in bizarre contexts and, and we get along with them. Let me give you another uh, much better analyzed example, but I, I find it just as interesting. If you take, um, as in this upper diagram, uh, the measurements in this upper diagram, you take a, the, a light in a room like this it, and, and you vary its intensity, just ordinary white light with a dimmer switch. You go from, say, very dim to very bright and you do that gradually as with a dimmer switch. You see it as a continuum. No, you know, it's, it's pretty much a, lit a, a literal representation in your mind of what's happening um, in the real world as we can measure by um, independent instrumentation. But if you take wavelength, the length of the light, and you vary that continuously, starting, say, with short wavelength, as short as you can see it, deep uh, purple, and you gradually increase the length of the, way, uh, of the waves, light waves, you do not see that as a continuum. The mind is built in an entirely different way. We see it as colors. And uh, we run from, um, as you well know, in the, in the uh, color spectrum, uh, short wavelength to uh, long wavelength, we pass through four basic colors that we think we see, blue, green, yellow, red. And this is based simply upon the fact that uh, we are relatively insensitive to wavelength change over long stretches. And then there are zones as between blue and green where we become quite sensitive. And that's what these dips in this curve mean. These are sensitivity uh, curves. The lower they are, the more sensitive you are. So you perceive uh, hear a change going on between blue and green, and you are confused with it if you're asked to specify exactly where you are on the spectrum. It becomes a, quite an art to designate verbally the color that you have. Now, this has led to an extraordinary result in culture, but before I tell you what that result is uh, in cultural evolution of humanity all around the world, let me say that this is one of the uh, 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 cognitive phenomena that we are now understanding right down to the molecular basis. We know that uh, much of the uh, discrimination of this type, uh, breaking it up into basic colors, uh, occurs in the color cones of the retina. And uh, there are three of them, and there are three color pigments, and processing and classification occurs right there. And then we know that further classification occurs farther back in the optical nerves uh, beneath the brain and in a relay station where there are interneurons or connecting nerve cells that do further classification of the incoming impulses from those retinal cells. And the two combined help to explain a great deal of why we tend to classify wavelength grossly uh, into four basic colors and then have difficulty making finer decision, uh, discrimination. We know now even what, where the genes are, many of the genes that control those color pigments, the proteins, the apoproteins that determine uh, which uh, 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 wavelengths activate which cells. In fact, uh, recent, in recent reports in science uh, they're, they're, they, uh, are given the first uh, 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 DNA sequences and amino acid sequences for those various proteins. So we're right down to the physical, physical chemical level. Now working back up, let me cite an experiment performed 20 years ago by two psychologists at the University of California, Paul Kay and Brent Berlin. Uh, they uh, took a standard color array of this type, left to right going from 
uh, uh, long wa wavelengths to short, and from top to bottom, uh, high intensity to low intensity. This is the Munsell array, it's a standard color scheme array for classification of colors. And they asked native speakers of 20 languages from around the world, many of them having no connection through history at all, uh, to place intuitively by pointing out on that Munsell array where various words were uh, in their own language. Uh, rouge, rot, and so on, uh, and more subtle color terms. And they found that, uh, in fact, these people, uh, when you averaged up the points for the color term for each word across all the various languages, clustered their color terms inside the least ambiguous zones. Very few words in any language were ever placed in the zone of rapid transition of ambiguity. And so there was a, um, uh, a kind of convergence in, uh, in the formation of color vocabularies in cultures around the world, and we know what the physical and genetic basis of it is now. In a remarkable experiment about 10 years ago, Eleanor Roche of the University of California at Berkeley performed an experiment which I think may in fact foreshadow what will be done in the social sciences in the 21st century. She went to the Dani people in New Guinea with this information, this conception. Uh, these were people who had just been contacted and they had one of the smallest color vocabularies in the world, just several words for denoting colors. I mean, the, the number of terms used vary greatly among cultures, although this is a consistent pattern of clustering. And she taught two groups of volunteers, one group of Dani. She taught uh, new Dani words. She made them up, you know, reasonable Dani-like words. Uh, and she fixed them on to uh, points in the Munsell uh, uh, display that were in these modal groups, that is, you know, the groups uh, in the clusters around where most other cultures place them, where you're least likely to have difficulty. And in the other group, she did just the opposite. She taught them a color vocabulary, but she placed her color terms, you know, pointing to the uh, array, in these areas of greatest ambiguity. Uh, and uh, then she found that, uh, sure enough, the group in the modal or, quote, normal areas learned their vocabulary much faster and they retained it in their memory much longer. And when she gave them a choice, others a choice between a normal color cluster of, of terms and uh, the unusual one, they picked the normal. So here we have a feeling for how biology can constrain and direct culture. And I believe that that is the way we're going to go in the future in uh, understanding how biology, biological evolution, and cultural evolution interact. Let me give you yet another example of many that are beginning to emerge, and some of which are beginning to show us what the linkages between cultural evolution and biological evolution are like. This is uh, from experiments performed by uh, Gerda Schmetz at the University of Brussels. She took computer, uh, never mind the classifications that are shown up here, let's just pay attention to this row here. She took computer generated designs, arbitrary designs, but that, uh, that were defined only by the amount of complexity in them, the redundancy. So here's one that has a lot of redundancy, very little complexity, uh, this design. Here's one with an intermediate level and here's one with a greater uh, complexity. And then she uh, wired adult volunteers up and showed them these, um, and took the electroencephalograms of adults who had these things flashed in front of her. And she measured alpha waves. And you may know that uh, the higher your alpha waves on the uh, EKG, um, the, the more contented you are. You know, you get settled down in a torpid, peaceful way and your EKG, your alpha waves go up. If you are suddenly aroused, there's a knock on the door, uh, a striking image is presented to you or whatever, uh, your, your alpha waves are damped, they, they're, they're lessened. So she used that damping of alpha waves as a measure of arousal. And then she compared uh, all these diagrams of different degrees of complexity. And she found that maximum arousal was about this degree 
of uh, complexity, roughly the equivalent of a maze or a figure with 10, 20 twists in it. Now, you may not think that that's arousing you the most, but I'll bet it is. And uh, the significance of this may well be that uh, you will note that it's about at this level that we place a lot of our art, logos, colophons, frieze designs, grill work, uh, abstract art, and the like. Uh, there may be, in fact, a biological basis for at what level of complexity in design and, and ideogram, uh, ideographs uh, in uh, uh, Oriental languages, Mayan, this glyphs, and so on. Um, there, there may have been this constraint working in the evolution of human cultures worldwide as to why we chose this level roughly instead of this or something far more complicated. A Martian or, you know, a, someone from the planet uh, off Sirius might find it's quite curious that we settle it about this level instead of, say, way over here somewhere. Now, speaking of science fiction, I'm now going to uh, try to uh, place the human species in a proper context. The problem with studying human beings is that we only have one species. And um, therefore, we think we're it. We, you know, we think we are practically all seeing and all hearing and all thinking and so on. It's just a matter of our learning a bit more and, and we'll see everything from every angle and, and understand everything in every way. Uh, but in fact, uh, uh, we are very peculiar. And in order to illustrate this point, uh, my colleague Charles Lumpton and I invented two uh, extreme civilizations, let's say off on planets off the star Arcturus. And these little creatures here we called Eidolons. And we said, suppose you could look on in on Eidolons and see them uh, in a schoolyard setting. And sure enough, they're passing on culture. They're about at our level. They have love songs about our level and scientific inquiry and, and funeral uh, rites and other rites of, uh, of uh, transition and so on. And you know, they look just about humanoid, except that when you look in on them closely, they, all the information has to be learned. It has to be transmitted in schools and books and everything. The only thing is that they can only learn one thing of each category, they only, only have able to learn one love song, only able to do one funeral rite, only able to learn one uh, rite of initiation, so on. They're like the white crowned sparrows, uh, which uh, sing beautifully. They have to learn their song from their parents or other birds, but they can only learn one song. If they don't learn that one, they don't learn anything. Well, you can still build a civilization that way. Uh, that's at one extreme. And we know human beings are not that, for sure. Now we go over to the other planet and we see the Exidrans. Now the Exidrans are about the same level as the Eidolons uh, as far as complexity of, of um, behavior and of richness of the culture and so on. But they're the opposite extreme. Everything is taught and they're equally able and prone to learn anything. So their culture is constantly drifting. Um, it's always changing because uh, they find one thing just about as attractive or easy to learn as something else. You know, they're able to learn calculus as well as they're able to learn uh, love songs or, or uh, rock and roll or whatever. And so the culture moves along like that. Um, human beings aren't at that. I assure you, they're not Zenidrid. Although many social scientists, social theorists to this day think we are Zenidrins. That's wrong. We're somewhere between the Eidolons and the Zenidrins. We learn, we transmit everything, but we are constrained culturally. And that is the question then of great interest. From category to category, where do we fit? How much of our behavior is constrained and what is the effect of it? Now let me come in addressing finally, my last point to make, uh, how scientists, I believe, biologists, social scientists, and psychologists are going and, and going to be addressing this issue in the future. And I, I foresee a tremendous rate of convergence among uh, scientists in this regard. Uh, for myself, I have begun to talk um, easily with uh, 
colleagues like Marvin Minsky, the pioneer of artificial intelligence, Noam Chomsky, who's pioneered in linguistic and so on. For the first time, we seem to have a common perception over large areas of how to go about studying the origin, the meaning of the mind. We're a long, long way from there, uh, you know, presenting a, any kind of a pretty picture or anything that we call great breakthroughs, but I think we're approaching it. And it's worthwhile uh, in approaching these problems in this manner of the linkage between biology and culture in seeing just where the human species fits in in evolution. And so I've suggested the four great steps of evolution uh, as indicated in this diagram. The first one took place more than th three and a half billion years ago. And that was the origin of life itself represented here by bacteria. For nearly three billion years, the great part of the history of life on Earth, life was stuck at that level. This was, these are prokaryotic cells, which means they don't have true nuclei, they don't have a lot of the cell machinery that makes the complicated advanced cell that's the basis of higher life. And it took literally three billion years to break through and come to the second great step, which was the creation of the eukaryotic cell. And that's a typical cell with a nucleus, uh, in the case of plants, with chloroplasts to do the photosynthesis and all this other machinery for uh, uh, packaging uh, DNA and RNA and so on and, and uh, running the, the uh, energy uh, processes in the mitochondria and then the like. Well, once that remarkable engineering feat was achieved, the second great step, then in short time, a mere, perhaps a mere 100 million years, we came up with the next great step, which was the putting together of vast numbers of these cells to create the first multicellular organisms represented here by an earthworm. And when that happened, then we had this great explosion of diversity in life forms uh, that uh, led to the world fauna and flora that we have today. But after that occurred, there was to be a wait of more than 600 million years before the next great advance occurred, and it occurred in only one species, uh, and that, of course, was the mind itself and self-awareness of a high level and, above all, uh, behavior, social behavior based upon cultural transmission. And I've represented that here by a little Australopithecus boy seeing his image in the, uh, in the water and reflecting on it for the first time. The evolution that occurred with that, the physical evolution, is one of the most astonishing uh, events in all the history of evolution. About one million years ago, at the time we were about at the early Homo level, at Homo erectus in Asia and Africa, the brain started increasing at the rate of about a cubic inch every 100,000 years. And that's about a heaping teaspoon, uh, tablespoonful every 100 thousand years. That's when this explosion, you know, this great bulging began. Uh, it reached its peak at about th um, 300 to 500,000 years ago when uh, the brain for a short period of time, uh, brain capacity, brain volume was being added to at an incredible 10 cubic inches every 100,000 years. And then with, at this point we had reached the, the true Homo sapiens level, our present level, roughly. And, and then it slowed down drastically. Uh, but something quite extraordinary happened because that was the most, possibly the most rapid evolution of a complex organ ever in the history of life. It entailed changes in the, the microscopic structure and arrangement of these cells, particularly in the parietal area where the speech centers are, that we haven't even begun to understand fully yet. Uh, and so we have to ask ourselves, exactly what drove, suddenly about a million years ago, started driving this one species at breakneck speed to our present level. Uh, and that process is, ha has to be the interaction of biological and cultural evolution in a very special way. And I'm going to illustrate this uh, conception with a cartoon from uh, the scientist's favorite cartoonist. I don't know why it is. I'm sure everyone is a, is a or most people are a fan of Larson, uh, but scientists love him. 
scientists exchange his cartoons through the mail all the time. He's, on, he's really got something there. So here he's got uh, this conception. He must, I think he read one of my books um, down beautifully. And it says, as Thok worked frantically to start a fire, a Cro-Magnon man, walking erect, approached the table and simply gave Thena a light. Now, Thena, no doubt impressed, uh, is more likely, according to the theory, uh, to have gone off with the Cro-Magnon man, and um, to um, uh, then the children would have been more likely to have whatever genes he had that allowed him to have the capacity uh, to uh, uh, do this uh, technological innovation and transmit it, and so on. And, and thus, cultural innovation and ability to transmit that culturally by, by teaching and by example and so on, by language, if you will, must have had an enormous advantage. I mean, intuitively, we know that's got to be right. Um, so that the cultural evolution must have driven biological evolution by providing what were effectively new mutants. Whenever there was a, uh, a possibly even a slight increase in linguistic ability, of cultural retention, transmission, of innovation, of exploratory drive, of, of tribal cohesiveness expressed in ritual and other cultural means, by other cultural means, that is very likely to have given a great advantage then to the individuals that had the genetic capacity for that. And for possibly 500,000 years, culture then drove as a great new afterburner, as it were, biological evolution in a way that had never been driven before. Somehow that afterburner had never been worked onto biological evolution before. It was the first time it ever happened. And when it did, it just vaulted the human species into a wholly new adaptive level. But similarly, all of this was accomplished in roughly a million years. And surely, uh, we did not level ourselves out into total blank information processing machines. We surely have the heritage, like a palimpsest of, of, uh, of old genetic designs and the like that were highly advantageous in the past uh, to, uh, that today affect our biological, our, our, our cultural uh, inheritance. I've given you examples of this already that can be, that are simple enough to uh, be analyzed. It seems very likely that most human traits, like uh, the propensity towards certain forms of altruism, tribalism, uh, with its connecting religious fanaticism, uh, potential for it, uh, and so on, have um, the, um, uh, uh, must, uh, must be affected in the same way. And we need to get down now to the bottom of this to understand where these qualities of mind, our capacities, propensities, and so on came from, what their evolutionary history was, what their mechanical basis is, and material basis is, and brain structure and then development of cognition. And perhaps all that knowledge will uh, help extricate us uh, from some of these extraordinary difficulties and impasses and, and the brutal Mexican standoffs that we encounter in the, uh, in the news every day. This is a somewhat more formal uh, representation uh, than uh, the one by Larson of Thena and Thok uh, of the process as a circuit. We call it the gene culture uh, coevolutionary circuit. It's gene culture coevolution, meaning the, uh, the evolution together of culture and biology. And the conception is as follows the genes uh, basically prescribing the way the brain is put together in ways that the biologists are beginning to understand better and better produces then uh, this uh, remarkable uh, organism, the, the newborn infant. And we now know increasingly from studies of, uh, of infants that the infant, even newborn infants, are endowed with remarkable capacities to choose and discriminate. And this ability and propensity to learn certain things better than others, to choose certain things better than others or more than others as a child choosing among foodstuffs uh, helps to guide uh, the entire culture uh, toward uh, certain uh, activities as opposed to others. And within a society, and of course the particularities of which are dependent upon cultural history and yet with similarities across cultures, within that culture people who are most successful in fitting into it 
uh, in finding mates and bonding and utilizing tribal associations, economy of the group and so on, are the ones most likely to survive and have children and thus pass their genes on uh, to uh, cement further uh, the linkage between genes and culture. This doesn't tell us much about our future history or what our ultimate capacity is as a species. Some uh, sociobiology in particular gets a bad rap uh, because uh, people tend to think of this type of perception as indicating that, that uh, those who study in this field believe that human beings have reached the end of their tether, that they're basically automata and they have no capacity to change, well, it's not at all. We, in fact, what it could be is liberating by telling us uh, just how we were put together and, and what our capacities are. In other words, what capacities we have that are untapped, how we might sublimate and control those propensities that um, have proven more so dangerous to us now in a nuclear age. Um, some years ago, the French uh, novelist uh, Jeanne Boulier also known as Vercors, uh, wrote uh, in his remarkable book, um, You Shall Know Them, that all of mankind's troubles come from the fact that we do not know what we are and do not agree on what we want to become. The way out of that dilemma, I would like to suggest, uh, is to go to the roots of human nature and of the interaction of culture and biolo biological evolution in the origin of the human mind to try to reformulate social science, social theory, our whole perception of ourselves uh, with the aid of biology. And in doing so, we have the, we don't know exactly where this will lead us, but it will surely uh, offer the hope of leading us out of some of our most uh, intractable difficulties. And it would also offers the prospect of opening whole new chapters uh, in the history of biology and uh, the social sciences and psychology. Thank you. I think we have uh, some questions. I'm going to be, I think the way it's been worked here is I've been gathering some questions that, gathering questions that are, I'm going to ask or are going to be asked me or, I, I guess Ms. McKaminsky's uh, on her way. All right, we'll handle it that way. Uh, the ushers will be coming around to collect some more cards. I have a few to start with. Thank you for your talk. Um, I'm going to ask from now on that you print more clearly. I sometimes can't read these questions, not because I don't think they're good, but I don't know what they say. Um, do you think that environmental factors can act on or change the genotype? Uh, no. <laughs> I have to decipher another question. <laughs> Um, Except by mutations, random mutations, which we don't want. You said that brain development has slowed down now that we've reached Homo sapiens stage. Will it start up again, and if so, why, and to what result? Uh, it won't start up again, I don't believe. Um, it's possible to have some enough genetic change to really affect mental development uh, in as few as 40 generations. Um, maybe even less, but that's just a theoretical result. We don't know that that's really happened within historical times. But the evidence seems to show that um, that no later than about 30 million years ago, you know, about the time that uh, artistic representation uh, began, um, and possibly as far back as two, three hundred thousand years ago the brain had reached its present size, the uh, Homo sapiens type uh, brain configuration was pretty much in place. Neanderthal, incidentally, had uh, a much, in some respects, a simpler 
uh, brain configuration. So the sapiens type, which replaced Neanderthal, had moved on beyond that level. So it appears that this phenomenal growth had pretty well slowed down or stopped uh, as recently as 300, 400,000 years ago. Uh, and it's very likely that we have really slowed things down now, even if they were creeping along in terms of brain structure and human capacity, um, because we, uh, because, simply because of our technology. We are uh, moving rapidly toward uh, societies, and that, that's what we want to do, uh, in which there uh, is a sufficient compassion for others and a concern for medical, uh, for uh, public health, uh, for uh, medical care, and uh, for reproductive rights and the like, that uh, we probably have virtually stopped uh, the process of natural selection uh, in most uh, countries. Uh, you know, natural selection is a brutal process, and I think it's one of the first things that we got rid of uh, in, in a modern society differential reproduction, differential survival. We're trying to get rid of it. That combined with, you know, the tremendous amount of gene flow, mixture of formally separate or semi-separated genetic populations uh, is beginning to uh, render the human species more and more hu homogeneous uh, so that we'll have one vast gene pool effectively with much more rapid flow back and forth of genes uh, throughout uh, five to 10 billion people. And that sort of thing is not conducive toward uh, further evolution. So I think probably we're in a position of stasis. I'm not worried about it. Uh, you know, as I, don't, I think we've, we've got the machinery. We're, we're not deteriorating, that's for sure. Uh, we, you know, that, that is not happening. We have a, a marvelously healthy and diverse gene pool to draw from in the future. If we ever reach the point as quote, I emphasize, if we ever reach the point and the level of knowledge that we want to alter the human gene pool, there's an immense reservoir to uh, draw from, which is pretty safe right now, pretty stable, in, in my opinion. These are two <laughs> questions which essentially are asking the same thing. In what ways do you see culture as influencing biological evolution? And similarly, or as an extension of that, in the gene culture combination, which is more influential, macroculture such as television or microculture such as family influences? Uh, what was the macroculture thing again? Television. Uh, oh, these, television. These, these I thought for a moment they said her heroism. <laughs> television, yeah. <laughs> um, well, as I indicated, at least through a large part of human history, um, the, uh, the culture was uh, probably a driving force in uh, biological evolution. Now, uh, we are prone to dis, uh, many people are prone to discount that because they think of culture more in technological terms. Um, you know, they recognize that we were in a pretty static uh, hunter-gatherer level with stone tools for most of our million year history and, and therefore, you know, what culture was there that was driving the mental evolution along or brain evolution along? Well, that's not what counts. What really counts, quite evidently, in, in human brain structure uh, is communication, particularly verbal communication, uh, symbolism, uh, and uh, complex social contract formation. And that is where human beings are extraordinarily brilliant uh, in recognizing other people, in remembering long histories of associations, contracts, and so on. When you go into a hunter-gatherer society uh, and you listen to their talk, fortunately some anthropologists have started paying attention to small talk and gossip, and you, you may wonder what it's like, what it is. What is it that probably human beings have been doing for at least half a million years uh, around the campfires and while they're out walking, you know, looking for roots and and, uh, and rabbits. Uh, and what they talk about incessantly is each other. Uh, they're constantly gossiping and palavering, you know, what deal was made, who owes what, uh, whether so-and-so was telling the truth when he said he shot the antelope, you know, blah, 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 palaver, palaver, palaver. You know, who's, who's untrue to whom, uh, you know, uh, what the widow so-and-so is gonna be. And, um, uh, you know, out of this comes, um, an immensely complex network of human relationships to which technology is, is almost um, 
secondary. So that uh, that is, uh, to a large extent, is what has been building us up. And that's why it may be a heck of a lot easier to write a novel than to uh, learn calculus. <laughs> Let me say that you all write much more clearly oh, when the there's macro light versus on in the micro. Room. I, I, yeah, I, I really don't know what effect uh, mac, you know, a television is affecting us uh, biological evolution. I, I know it turns our brains to mush individually, but <laughs> we, I don't think it's affecting our genetics at all. So if we want to junk it all after a generation or two and, and go back to reading books, I think our genetic apparatus will be intact. <laughs> Do you think there is any chance that cultural evolution, which has proceeded from cannibalism to forms of warfare, will stop the human race from total self-annihilation? Uh, that cultural evolution, which has proceeded from cannibalism to? To forms of warfare. Well, I, I think we've gotten more dangerous. Uh, we, uh, we may never have really practiced cannibalism. That's, incidentally, that's a moot point. Uh, cannibalism never was very important uh, because cannibals get all sorts of horrible things transmitted. If you eat someone without cooking them properly, you get <laughs> everything they've got. So this is the, one of the probably the reasons why human beings almost everywhere have a natural revulsion toward cannibalism. It's, uh, it really is a rare thing. But the uh, warfare, we're still, uh, we haven't really progressed at all in terms of warfare, at, at least in, you know, in our attitudes toward warfare. Warfare appears to be a, um, a near universal in hunter-gatherer societies. We like to think about those wonderful tassadai in the Philippines, you know, are supposed to sit around um, like Stone Age hippies and commune and never think about war or aggression. But in fact, uh, historical records show that um, hunter-gatherer societies have traditionally been at war a large part of the time in one form of territorial conflict or another with death uh, and uh, sometimes with ritual spear throwing and the like, but uh, with uh, aggression, tribal aggression, territorial aggression being a, a uh, very widespread trait in human history. Um, what we have done essentially with our cultural evolution is to move from spears to nuclear missiles. And we still act pretty much the same. I mean, the Eastern Mediterranean is basically like uh, the, the boundary between the Dani and their nearest neighbor in New Guinea in the way we are behaving. And uh, so I think probably we are more dangerous today. However, it does appear that if we could somehow uh, get out of that nightmare period of high technology, which you know, is quite capable of destroying us all, we, we have acquired a certain uh, greater sense of, of grace and humanity potential through our education, through our greater knowledge. Uh, so we seem to be a bit more capable of religious ideological tolerance at foundation um, if, uh, you know, if we can put that knowledge to use. In other words, there are lots of people who, who understand that well enough. I see we have an objection here. What would it be? Tremendous cockroach. What's that? Oh, a tremendous conference going on. Oh, a cockroach. Thank you. I, I thought I had said something absolutely unacceptable, and it's a cockroach. I'm the curator of entomology at the Museum of Comparative Zoology. Would you like to take it back with you? <laughs> That's an adult male Paraplanita americana. <laughs> right. And if we're not careful, They'll be the only thing left in New York. <laughs> if we catch it, we'll put it in a box and you can take it back as no a donation thanks. from the Y. <laughs> How do you respond to the criticism that sociobiology has racist tendencies? That's the, um, the albatross around the neck of this uh, line of inquiry. It's a false charge because um, there isn't any connection between the study of the biological basis of human nature and, uh, and uh, the roots of racism. 
which have to do really with uh, group conflict and hatred of other people based upon often very trivial physical traits. I think sociobiology can in fact help to understand where racism comes from and far from justifying it by understanding it can actually help to uh, ameliorate it because it is very dangerous. And to say that to study racism or to study some of the components that have gone into, the, into racism, even at the biological level, and to say that maybe we have a genetic propensities that lead us more easily into racist behavior than would otherwise be the case is by no means to condone it. The uh, parallel I have, uh, I make all the time is that uh, when it comes to schizophrenia or phenylketonuria or other conditions basic in human, you know, in, that we can get down to the molecular level, we understand them and we can um, actually trace their etiology. And having done so, a medical scientist, biochemist, uh, are not condoning it. They're not condoning the preservation of phenylketonuria or hemophilia or, or whatever. Uh, far from it. Having, uh, that's a non sequitur, far, uh, having perceived its harmful effects and having entered into a society and a social contract which condemns it for good reasons, we use that knowledge, that form of research uh, to uh, help eradicate it. Incidentally, I think that's pretty well died down now anyway. That was a fun thing to hear about 10 years ago. This sociobiology racist, but it's not anymore. It's, Incidentally, it's, the subject has become very popular in the Soviet Union and other socialist countries, so that's tended to uh, sap the uh, argument that um, sociobiology is pro-capitalist and uh, a tool of the ruling class. <laughs> Here's a question that feeds right into the previous one. Since the least successful members of human species of the world are reproducing more rapidly, will the human race retrogress? No, um, because the differential reproduction is clearly based on, on cultural and local environmental factors. There, there isn't any evidence whatsoever that uh, differential reproduction from one part of the world to the other, you know, say from Sweden to Kenya, uh, has a genetic basis. Uh, both of these parts of the world and other parts of the world have had um, uh, fluctuating episodes in which there were periods of rapid population growth and then periods of slow rep uh, reproductive uh, population growth. Um, there's no evidence that um, the gene pool uh, is any less able, any less capacity uh, from one part of the world to the next. So if uh, Brazilians outproduce us, outproduce Californians for a generation or two, it, it could hardly make any difference. I'm going to answer this one first, and then I'll ask you. Are you familiar with Julian James from Princeton and his, break, and his book about the bicameral brain? And just for whoever asked this, he is among the people we're considering inviting to the series in future years. So you have to come back. Is, oh, is he, he will be coming back to the series, is yes. that right? Yeah. Well, he's a very interesting fellow that certainly stirred up a lot of, uh, a lot of um, hard thinking and, and debate. Uh, I may misrepresent it. I have read his book and heard a number of talks about it, uh, discussions about it, and probably there are people in this group who know more than I do about it. But basically it is that consciousness as we understand it, uh, particularly consciousness involving self-realization and self-reflection uh, and introspection arose it, within historical times, in fact, arose after uh, Achaean Greece and the uh, Homeric ballads. Um, uh, that um, it was in, in the earlier times, as evidenced by Homer and perhaps some of the earliest uh, historical writings that were transmitted by the Bardic poets, uh, he says there is no evidence that uh, the speakers were aware. Uh, that uh, of, of introspection of the condition of their own mind, that they were thinking these thoughts as individuals, that quite to the contrary, they assumed that they were inner thoughts were being put into them by the gods. Hence the bicameral uh, brain. The, um, there are a lot of difficulties with that. And um, for one, um, 
the testimony of, of early writings, uh, particularly uh, bardic, uh, you know, preliterate poetry, is a pretty tenuous form of negative evidence to exclude the possibility that people were being reflective in that manner. Another major difficulty with it is that all human populations today, so far as we know, from the simplest hunter-gatherers in Northern Territory of Australia uh, to um, uh, the uh, dwellers of 92nd Street, all have that introspective ability. They have a unicameral brain in that sense. And in order for this to have happened, uh, you would have had to somehow have it happen all the way around the world simultaneously, which uh, does not make any biological sense at all. I think that's about where it is. Uh, one should keep an open mind, but I, I think that it's not a highly regarded theory at the present time. However, Dr. Jane uh, may have, 15 minutes with him might convince me otherwise, so I want to keep an open mind. Since individuals with Down syndrome have a different number of chromosomes, couldn't they comprise another species? What constitutes a, a species? Uh, individuals with what? Down's syndrome. Damage. Oh, Down's Down syndrome. syndrome. Oh, yeah, Down syndrome is. Oh no, they have. Uh, uh, they, they have three uh, chromosomes at position 21. They have 47 chromosomes, uh, but that obviously doesn't make them a different species. Anyway, uh, what it does is to create certain abnormalities in development, which um, we uh, hopefully will learn to remedy, possibly eventually with genetic surgery in which the uh, third chromosome could be taken down, or at least the signaling off the 26 pair, or the, uh, what the pair is, 21, the pair number 21, or then it would be triplet 21, uh, might be muted enough so as to uh, you know, bring it down to within normal levels. There are lots of ways to do that. But what is a species? A biological species is defined as a population or a series of populations that, uh, are, that freely interbreed uh, or are capable of freely interbreeding under natural conditions. And it can include a wide range of genetic variants uh, within that population. The criterion used by biologists is the uh, capacity or propensity to freely interbreed under natural conditions. And therefore, uh, the, uh, the mild uh, chromosome aberrations of human beings. I mean, you know, the ones uh, other than things like Creta shot and, and some of the other major abnormalities that kill the people or render them helpless. Um, don't uh, in any way create a new population of interbreeding individuals separate from the human species. So we're nowhere near anything like that. Where are genes in the body? Where are genes in the body? As opposed to the ones that you wear. <laughs> uh, they are in uh, structures called chromosomes, which are really sausage-like packages of proteins with two strands of a double helix of DNA inside them. Those strands of, uh, double strands of DNA uh, contain a series of, of units called nucleotide pairs, which are the letters, like alphabet letters of the genetic code. And blocks of those, or strings of those, work together to transmit information out into other parts of the cell that ultimately uh, determine which proteins are produced, particularly enzymes. I'm getting a C minus if there are any biochemists, because I'm, I'm not practiced at describing this. But uh, essentially, that is where the genes are. They are sections of the, uh, uh, of the DNA uh, strings. Incidentally, to give you an idea of just how complicated those genes are, most people don't uh, realize how complicated a human being is. I think most people think of it, you know, of, of a, the human genome as, uh, well, it's complicated, but, you know, it's like a few thousand little beads on a, on a string or something like that, and some sort of magic occurs. Let me tell you how complicated it is. Uh, we know <coughs> uh, the uh, amount of DNA and, <coughs> and the, uh, the size of the molecule and so on in mice, in the common house mouse, which has been well worked out at Bar Harbor in Maine. And it goes like this. If you took all the chromosomes, all the DNA, in the chromosome of one cell of a mouse, probably the cockroach as well is comparable, or us would probably be comparable, and you took it and you pulled it all out, see it's tightly coiled, 
in the chromosomes most of the time in the, re in the resting state. If you took it and you pulled it all out into a single uh, molecule, it would, uh, the, the molecule would be um, uh, about a meter long, literally, absolutely, that's how long, out of that invisible cell it would come out as a thread, about a meter long, but it would be invisible because it's only 20 angstroms across, it's only about one ten millionth of an inch across, so it would be invisible. Now, if you could somehow uh, enlarge that string until finally it became visible, let's say about the width of a piece of wrapping string, then uh, you've enlarged the whole thing now so you can see it clearly. It's as wide as a, a piece of wrapping string. The question would be, um, how long would your string be? And some people might say, well, would it go to the end of the room? Would it go, you know, three blocks down the the road and so on. The answer is that it would go 600 miles. And along each inch, if you could walk that 600 miles, you would read off about 20 to 30 letters, nucleotide letters, each of one, each of which contains genetic, or, or many of which contain genetic information. Some are silent, but many contain genetic. These comprise about a quarter of a million so-called structural genes which encode the information, the basic information on what enzymes are produced that produce ultimately our brain. So we're dealing here with um, uh, a piece of machinery, so to speak, that, that is, um, you know, astronomically more complicated than anything we have yet conceived of in a, in a direct and literal way. And we're impressed by microcomputers. <laughs> we're a long way from duplicating it by microcomputers. My uh, friend Lumsden, who I worked with several years on the origin of the mind, um, and as a computer specialist, um, once sat down with me and, and uh, we worked out the full repertory of an ant, you know, how many things an ant does and so on. And at that time, it was about three years ago, he um, figured that um, the ant brain is about one millionth to one ten millionth the size of a human brain. But he figured out that if we took the most advanced, uh, you know, microchip, technology of three years ago, and uh, you could produce an ant brain that would do, allow the, a machine to do all the things an ant does. Uh, but it would, uh, the ant brain would now have to be about the size of a basketball. And the, in order to get this, uh, to build an artificial ant, it, the ant itself would have to be about the size of a Volkswagen. That's the state of the art, you know, in comparison with uh, what organic evolution has done. So. If you, someone wanted to contribute 10 to a hundred billion dollars, we could build an ant. <laughs> <laughs> well, Volkswagens were known as bugs, weren't they? <laughs> this will be the last question. In today's Science Times, there was an article referring to Freud's early 1915 writing that suggested memories of events like the Ice Age could determine man's later behavior. For example, tyrannical tri tribal chiefs being the precursor of Oedipal problems. What is the germ of truth in this? I wish I had read the New York Times today, but I, I, I know what they're talking about. Um, I don't think very much of that sort of stuff. Uh, <laughs> Freud made up some pretty little stories, you know, about the primal horde and, and so on. It was kind of quasi-biological in that he had evolutionary scenarios uh, such as the sons in the primal horde uh, hating and finally killing the father, dream of killing the father, mating with the mother and everything like that. And um, that particular story runs straight counter to our knowledge now of how human, early human societies were constructed and straight counter to the information we now have on the avoidance of incest. We now know that at least one form of, of incest, sibling incest, is avoided automatically by a psychological inhibition rule such that um, children raised together during the first six years of life, either one in the first six years of life contacting the other, are automatically turned off, inhibited, you know, like a switch being turned off, so that even if they're not real brother and sister, they're unrelated, and even if, as in the Israeli kibbutzim, uh, it's hoped that they will marry later on, but they were raised in the same domestic proximity, um, that even if that happens, uh, they are turned off and, and virtually incapable of, uh, of forming a long-term sexual bond. Uh, so we know that, uh, we know the basis of that. We know that inbreeding 
causes a much higher level of defective uh, uh, events in children and uh, is part of a nearly universal or extremely widespread phenomenon found in the animal kingdom. So uh, in, this, in these respects, I mean, Freud was so far off the mark, and he, I don't think he, was, uh, he understood Darwinism either. He didn't understand what natural selection was all about and so on. Maybe, maybe he did, but I don't remember seeing any reference to that. Um, I, you know, Freud's fun in games, and it's easy to understand, but that's not where it is now as far as explaining the origin of the human mind, and I better, you better show me the back way out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.